Well, welcome everyone to our study of a history of Christianity, the conclusion to our study. Um, so glad to have uh, Professor Maxie Birch and Professor Dave Vila with us this morning to conclude uh, their excellent study. And I just want to again uh, commend you two for such a great job um, and uh, a, just so much appreciation on my part and on the parish's part for you all. I know this has been a sacrifice with y'all teaching at JBU as well. So thank you for your time and effort to lead us. We appreciate it so much. I'll begin with a prayer, then I'll turn it over to them and uh, let them have it. So let us pray. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world, evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So, Maxie and Dave, it's all yours. Okay, well, um, good morning. Uh, the way we're going to do this this morning is uh, kind of do just a kind of brief summary of some things that we've covered. Uh, maybe draw a few out some questions, conclusions, a few things. So, so I'm going to go first with uh, things that I dealt with, and then I'll turn it over to Dave and let him cover all that he did. Uh, enjoyed having this time with you. I mean, uh, you know, for Dave and I, this is what we do. Um, but part of the reason we do it is because we like it. And, um, and of course, uh, we believe it's important uh, that we know our history, or at least significant portions of it, so that it better informs us about who we are, our identity, and that um, we're part of a, a long history of believers going way, way back, and we share this common commitment to Jesus Christ, and we have so much to learn from each other. So uh, it matters that we're aware of this continuity that we have going back into the first century, and that we we share so much with those who have gone before of us and we have so much to learn from them. Um, so anyway, thanks for uh, allowing us time to, uh, to unpack um, some of these things. So anyway, so uh, yeah, just some concluding remarks. So um, I, uh, and like I said, this is all gonna be from my perspective, very broad. Um, I looked at the first uh, two centuries and talked about the early church. Um, in the second century, how the church emerges from Judaism and what that looked like, uh, remembering that the early, very early Christians were Jews um, and that they were, they didn't have I, I don't get the impression I'm teaching New Testament right now, and, I think, and Dave is too. Uh, it's good, I think, to teach the history of the faith, but also to teach New Testament. It's kind of nice to teach them at the same time, because I'm reminded that they're, best I can tell, apart from Jesus sending his people out as witnesses of what they had seen and heard, uh, there was no strategic plan. That's what I'm saying. They, they, they didn't they didn't have all this figured out. There was not some strategic plan that they were following. Um, and therefore, um, I'm so grateful, uh, particularly even as I read the New Testament, and um, remember that Acts 15 is a very critical chapter in our Bible. When these Jewish Christians made some very monumental decisions, and the most significant one is that they basically said, well, Gentiles don't have to become Jews because before they can follow Christ. That's huge because it is a fundamental statement about the gospel. And so this second church that's emerging from Judaism 
is a part of Jews uh, intentionally uh, deciding that we are not going to put any barriers in the way of these Gentiles who are coming to Christ. Um, so uh, Christianity finds its way out of its Jewish roots, but never completely leaving them. And then on the outside, in the Gentile side, we talked about how the Romans are just not sure who these people are. And of course, in the first couple of centuries, this causes significant problems and issues. Then we talked about the New Testament writings that are emerging during this time. Uh, we talked about the canonical process. At the same time, the churches that, that these documents are actually being written, the church is actually at the same time starting to think of, well, what, what do we mean when we talk about the scriptures? Of course, we have the Old Testament, but now we have these other documents that are emerging. And so uh, as again to the second century, the church is uh, trying to decide which of these documents are actually authoritative. And we have this whole process that begins and lasts well into the late third, and certainly the fourth century, as they finalize what we have is our New Testament. We talked about polity, how leadership emerges in the, in the church, um, and that certainly in these first couple of centuries, um, being a, a, a leader in the church is a pretty dangerous thing. Um, uh, because of uh, the uncertainty of the times and how the church is being perceived in the world in which it's emerging as it spreads across the Roman Empire. Uh, but that the leadership structure comes to actually define the church um, as it organizes and spreads uh, the role of bishops particularly becomes significant. We talked about the continuity in worship and liturgy. Uh, that we learn a lot from the early church in terms of how the early church worshiped its liturgical practices, particularly centered around the Eucharist and baptism, um, which still is the mark of our faith that we share uh, as a global faith, uh, that we not just think and believe the same things, but we practice them in worship. Uh, then we talked about the persecutions of these centuries, the church's defense of the faith through apologetics, and that these responses of the church actually unintentionally, in a lot of ways, provide us with information we wouldn't otherwise have regarding the church's theology, worship, polity, social, political attitudes, sentiments. I mean, and this is one of the one of the rules of thumbs of history that I pointed out is that a lot of history is the history of the unintended. So the reasons people do something in one century provides um, uh, additional information for future centuries in ways that these early people weren't necessarily intending, but we can certainly be thankful for that. And then of course, the idea of martyrdom is in the early church, these first two centuries, the highest form of Christian discipleship. Uh, to be martyred, to uh, have your life ended as a witness for Christ was uh, considered to be an honor, a high form of discipleship. So yeah, so the first couple of centuries, then we talked about third and fourth centuries, how politics, uh, because uh, politics are, a part of the nature of the world, Christianity cannot avoid being a part of the world and political structures because politics is the way cultures decide questions of identity and direction. So Christianity becomes involved in these kinds of political conversations, although be fair to say Christians had mixed feelings about this because politically they were a persecuted faith in these first couple centuries. Then they get into the fourth century and suddenly we talked about uh, the attitudes, particularly of the Roman Empire changing and Christians are not exactly sure how to respond to this, moving from a period of persecution into a time in which in fact they become, you know, by the late fourth century, you know, almost uh, the uh, favored uh, faith of the empire. So, 
there's not, once again, a strategic plan here. Uh, and so I talked about how there were varying political theories that emerged during this time as Christians began to talk about, well, how are we supposed to do this? How should we respond to this? We talked about how theology can have significant political consequences as we looked at the ecumenical councils. Therefore, we should be careful deciding our theological beliefs. But more importantly, perhaps not just the beliefs we hold, but how we hold them. Because um, theology and um, inevitably, it seems, um, has a way of not just deciding what's true about who God is, who Jesus is, but also theology can become a way of deciding who's in and who's out. And that's where it becomes problematic. And so we have to hold our theologies very carefully so that they don't become just ways in which we decide who belongs in the kingdom and who doesn't. Uh, Christians have lived, uh, another point, they've lived under every kind of government. Christians have lived, because we're, we're, it's a global faith, we lived under every kind of government. So the question is not what form of government is really Christian. There's no, <laughs> I can't honestly think that there's a Christian form of government. There's just government and how Christians live uh, true to Christ wherever they are, whatever that looks like. And then we ended with the idea that the nature of the gospel is that it's a translated faith. Uh, and I think this goes back to this idea of Christians living in every form of government uh, and in every kind of culture we can think of. Um, and that the gospel is not the culture. Um, therefore, there's no privileged language for Christianity, no privileged culture, no nation, no political system. We, we, uh, we've, we've been present as a people under all of them, but none of them are privileged in the sense that the gospel is a translated, uh, it's the translation of the incarnation of Jesus Christ among us. And uh, it's the gospel that saves. And we just uh, have to be careful about not connecting it to anything particularly cultural and recognizing the difference. Uh, then the, we, it, one of the things we talked about, theology can work two ways. It can walk from the top down at communicable councils. We talked about from 325 to 451, from Nicaea to Chalcedon. And the church is trying to get Jesus right as best they could theologically, but to do that, they have to use language. Language is imprecise. To any language is imprecise when we start trying to talk about God uh, as being transcendent and imminent, the person of Christ being human and divine, we run immediately into problems of language. So there is this theology from the top down as, as bishops meet in ecumenical councils, they come to decisions about the person of Christ, and then this has implications as that theology per, uh, per, percolates down into the culture. Uh, uh, particularly things like the difference between Chalcedonian Christians and uh, related to the Roman Empire. And then, of course, uh, the Coptic Christians who don't sign on to the Chalcedonian Creed or the Nestorian Christians or Jacobite Christians who are the Syrian Christians of the East who are still brothers and sisters in Christ, but theologically they're, they're not signing on to Chalcedon. So the implications there. Uh, then we have theology from the bottom up. Uh, monasticism in the third century is uh, not a movement begun from a hierarchical perspective. It's a lay movement. Uh, comes out during periods of persecution, it's an emphasis on purity and holiness. Uh, it's a very rural movement. Uh, it's a lay movement in terms of its leadership. Uh, and it actually forms as a lay spiritual movement. It forms almost a parallel structure with the hierarchical structure of the church which suggests that spirituality, Christian spirituality is not uh, uh, primarily organizational or institutional. It is, uh, is relational. It, is, uh, it's, uh, it involves the transformation of the human being and not just institutional forms and practices and organizational structures. 
Then I had uh, Max's points to ponder how theology matters, which Dave and I have said numerous different times from the top down, from the bottom up, monasticism and the Episcopal structure of the church dem demonstrates the variety of ways we have expressed and practiced our faith in Christ. And, st and, and, and we still are. What we believe, the way we live, what we believe are important. Orthodoxy, orthopraxy. Uh, theology has relational, social, and political consequences. And, and then this plays out century after century after century in different ways. Uh, plays out in the period of, I talked about between 500 and 1400 with the rise of Christendom, which is uh, uh, the European uh, model, cultural model of Christianity. Uh, Christendom, the uniting of Christianity and the state kingdom which um, also coincides with the rise of the papacy and then uh, a movement to counteract this uh, in some ways, depending on the uh, conciliar position you take uh, to uh, provide more of a more general council structure to the church that balances out the whole role of, of the Pope and, 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 and the struggles that take place within European culture as as these forces begin to interact with one another and I raise some questions about the events between 500 and 800 that actually creates what we say is Christendom. Uh, the papacy acquiring the spiritual temporal power, particularly after 800 and the emergence of what we call the Holy Roman Empire. And then, and then the question, how does this alliance uh, shape Europe for eight centuries, which it does. Well, into the 16th century, Europe culturally is shaped by this attempt to unite the, the temporal uh, power of kings and emperors with the spiritual power of the church. Um, and it certainly shapes the history of Europe and leads into the next phase of the church when we talked about the Reformation, uh, where the church fragments between 15 and 1600. And a, and a couple of different things to think about here that the Reformation was a matter of timing and people. It wasn't inevitable. I mean, it, all, all the past seems inevitable to us because we look back and it happened. But for the people living in it, it's not. And so we talked about why, why does the Reformation begin with Luther and not with Hus? Because Jan Hus in the 15th century is saying the same thing that Luther says in the 16th century. Hus gets burned, Luther doesn't. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's hard to know the timing for how things happen. And that's why history becomes important to study. And then we have the whole idea of Protestantism, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, Bootser, the Anabaptist, and of course, then the Catholics who are not Protestants. But I guess I remember saying, but we were all Catholics until the 16th century. And guess what? They didn't go away. So, you know, what does the church look like now that we fragmented into just all these pieces? Um, yeah. And then uh, I, I kind of, I don't know if I talked about this, but Alistair McGrath wrote a, a pretty nice book called Christianity's Dangerous Idea. And I think it's a good summary for me of how to uh, read and think about the Reformation and what's, uh, what's happened in the church since that time. And his basic point is, it's not the Bible that's the problem here, or it's the issue. It's how we read and interpret it. So it's theology. And I try to help my theological students when I teach them to say, you know, there's the Bible and there's your theology of the Bible. They're not the same thing. And being able to separate the two out and recognize the difference of practice. Humility is uh, probably the most important thing we can do as followers of Christ. So McGrath says, well, the Protestants were, were really excited about translating the Bible into the vernacular, like Luther did translating the New Testament into German. And it's a wonderful thing to put the Bible in the hands of the common people. What the reformers did not anticipate was that the people whose hands they put the Bible in, they didn't anticipate those people wouldn't read the Bible the same way they did. Um, 
and then interpret it the way they thought it should be interpreted. And that's, you know, that's, that's our challenge. Uh, not that we have a Bible, but how we read it. And uh, this uh, course I'm teaching right now on global Christianity at JBU, students now are really wrestling with the difference between a very individualistic kind of uh, Western approach to the Bible where we read silently and we do our theology in our heads and a more communitarian approach in the non-Western, glo more global world where people come out of cultures that are communitarian and they don't read the Bible the same way we do. So their theology develops very differently. Um, and that's something I think we ought to take into account moving forward. Do Christians in other parts of the world perhaps provide some kind of balance for us and how we read scripture. Um, and then I, I'll end here with my questions or my rules of thumb for history, which I just think are, you know, good way to end what I did. Uh, actual history is simultaneous. We study it in fragments, so you have to recognize transition. It's not this and then that, it's always, it's all this more complicated transition from something to something. Um, as I've already said, most of history is the history of the unintended. We never beg the question, don't ever assume that some history had to happen the way it did. Uh, remember historians write history, so they always have agendas. Sometimes they unpack them and they tell you what they are, sometimes they don't. Like for example, 18th century historians referring to the Middle Ages as the Dark Ages. Well, the people back then weren't saying, I hate living in the Dark Ages or something. No one thought of themselves as Dark Age people. That's 18th century people looking and saying, look at those people, they were dumb and they lived in Dark Ages. So, I mean, we just have to be careful about our language because sometimes we can use pejorative language to refer to a period of history just because it's not our own as somehow not really what it should have been. Um, Pay close attention to people's sentiments and symbols that shaped them. Important question, what was it possible for the people of a particular time to have believed? Not what we wish they had believed, not what they should have believed if they were really smart, uh, not what we prefer, but really what did they actually believe? And was it possible for them to believe something else? Um, in other words, what it prevents us from doing is transposing our own ideas, our own values on another century and saying, well, gosh, they should have been more blank, whatever. Well, the question was, was it even possible for them to think that way? So then, then you're just kind of building a straw man and knocking him down because that wasn't something they could have thought because the whatever circumstances they lived in didn't allow for it. And then this idea of history within history, remember that Christianity is always seated in the history of the world, which I think is the whole message of the incarnation, that God becomes one of us right in the middle of the Pax Romana. And Jesus grows up in the world, surrounded by the history of the world, surrounded by its complications and its issues so we're always part of the world you know we're always part of the world's history and uh, that's how the kingdom of god works right now so anyway that's my stuff thanks for allowing me to share my stuff i'm going to stop sharing and switch over to my colleague dave so yeah Okay. Okay, I think I'm sharing mine now, and hopefully that that'll work. Um, and so, just uh, 
I'm going to take us back also to the beginning and where we uh, started the very first session that we had together and um, review a little bit about uh, who we are today uh, as a church and, and where the church is headed, and then take us back and um, kind of think through some of the things that we've, we've covered over the past um, seven or eight months it's been. Um, and so as we think about uh, the regional distribution of Christians and the transition from 1910 to 2010, um, the biggest thing that happens uh, here and that's gonna continue happening is that um, the Christian church becomes much less of a um, white European American thing and much more of an African uh, Latin American thing, much more of a Southern hemisphere thing um, than it was back in 1910. And that's a radical change. I mean, from Sub-Saharan Africa to go from 1.4% Christian of the world population of Christians in 1910 to um, almost a quarter of the world's Christians living in Sub-Saharan Africa in 2010 is just a shocking thing. Uh, and it means that the future of the church is gonna be radically different. Um, and not just uh, with skin color, or uh, but radically different understandings of um, what it means to be human and religious, and the uh, the relationship between faith and culture, and so many different issues that are um, um, not a threat to the church, but that will enrich the church in the next century or so. And so that's an exciting thing that, that's happening. Um, we also looked at, uh, you know, um, today the percentage of Christians. Um, uh, uh, are split 50% Catholic, 36.7% Protestant, about 12% Orthodox, and then others, I'm not sure who those are, but others, 1.3%, um, they don't fit into any of those other categories. So um, the vast majority of us, maybe not the vast majority, but 0.1% uh, of a majority of us Christians are uh, Roman Catholic. Um, and that's an important thing to remember too, you know, especially in you know, uh, we live in the South in Arkansas and in, in a part of the world that's sometimes called the Bible Belt. Um, and we tend to imagine that um, Christianity equals, you know, conservative Protestant evangelical Christianity or some such thing. Um, but that's not the case at all. Um, and I think I may, may have mentioned back in um, uh, when, when we covered this first that I've, I've had students over the years, uh, usually Latin American students will come to me in my office and say, um, I'll ask them, you know, it'll be a a New Testament or Old Testament class that I'm teaching, and I'll ask them, you know, what kind of, um, do you come from a faith tradition? And they'll say, um, or I might even ask, uh, are you Christian or something like that? Are you Christian background? And they'll say, uh, no, 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 I'm not Christian, I'm Catholic. <laughs> and um, just the, uh, you know, that always makes me very sad um, that they, that, um, you know, that the tradition that they're living in right now has somehow convinced them that they're that they're not Christian, that they're something other than Christian. Um, but anyway, so uh, a slight majority of the world's Christians are, of course, Roman Catholic. And then uh, the 10 countries with the largest number of Christians there on the right hand side. Um, and what's startling is that um, we have one country in Europe, Germany. Uh, I wonder what Martin Luther would think about that, um, you know, 500 years later that um, uh, the, the democratic group in DR Congo or Nigeria have more Christians um, in them than larger percentage of Christians in them than, um, than Germany. Um, very surprising thing. Um, but again, a very good thing. Um, a thing that uh, lets us know that, um, you know, the future of Christianity is going to be richly diverse in ways that maybe it hasn't been up until now. And that's, that's a good thing. Or, uh, you know, in this kind of um, bringing out some of the things from before, but um, the transition from uh, Christianity being a primarily globally North uh, religion to a globally South religion where, um, you know, you see the transition there that um, the global South uh, goes from 9.2% of, uh, of the world's Christians to 23.5% um, of the world's Christians um, in, the, in the Southern uh, section there. Or for, actually from, excuse me, from, um, 17 to 60, uh, 60 percent, and a few other more little charts just to, um, just to kind of let us see uh, who and where we are. Um, you know, the vast majority of Roman Catholics in the Americas, uh, primarily Brazil, um, Protestant also in the Americas, and again, um, partly the United States, but also quite a few Protestants in Latin America as well. But then again, that sub-Saharan Africa, you know, almost 30, 7% of Protestants um, live in sub-Saharan Africa. And what does that mean for the future of Protestantism that we better um, very quickly uh, 
come to terms with um, uh, that we are not a, a white religion uh, and shouldn't be. And then this uh, kind of curious projection into the future where, um, you know, the growth of Christianity in South uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, again, is, is enormous, um, so much so that um, between Latin America, Caribbean, and, and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, let's see, over 60, almost 65 percent of the world's Christians are going to be um, in that in that category, and so um, very, I don't know, I think very hopeful, very good thing uh, that, um, that Christ Christianity is growing, although people will sometimes lament that um, the United States is becoming secular and uh, the world is going to heck in a handbasket sort of thing, but um, Christianity is growing dramatically in, in other parts of the world, and that's a good thing uh, for the long term. We kind of went over briefly this sketch of branches of Christianity, um, and then this one that's even more um, detailed, but um, even that is just, just a, a thumbnail sketch of um, the past 2,000 years of the Christian church um, and its many developments. Um, you know, that's not even a tenth of the different branches and, um, and uh, distinctions that could be made in a, in a chart like that. Um, okay, but then let's talk about some of the main themes that, that um, I've kind of emphasized as we've gone through things. I'll put them up here, whoops, quickly, and then we'll go through them in a little bit more detail, but the richest and diversity of Christian traditions is one thing that I hope we've all come to a better appreciation of. Um, uh, through the over the past seven eight months, the importance of Christian unity as well, uh, the relationship between church and state that Maxie emphasized quite a bit, um, the relative importance of theology, liturgy, and service or outreach, and um, how to find a balance between those things, and what we can learn from the past with regard to balancing those things, and then also. Um, Last but not least, um, the importance of Jesus and Christian tradition is something that I think has um, stuck out to me as we've gone through these past um, eight months of, of church history. And so some of the themes um, that, that won the richest and diversity of Christian traditions, um, it's not uncommon for me, and pro I don't doubt for Maxie too, to have students who will come to us and say, you know, um, I was raised in this conservative evangelical tradition or Episcopal tradition or whatever, and um, I'm so disgusted with it, I just don't think I can be a Christian anymore. Um, and what I try to do with students who are struggling in that kind of way is to help them see the profound richness and diversity of Christian traditions. And, okay, so you're fed up with, you know, your Southern Baptist upbringing or your Methodist upbringing or your Presbyterian upbringing. Well, you know, what? within the, the, the family of Christianity, there's lots of different ways of being a faithful Christian. Um, you know, uh, and Maxie, this overlaps a little bit with some of the things that Maxie said, but there's the monastic traditions. There's the institutional traditions, the Orthodox and Coptic and um, uh, Roman Catholic and a variety of Protestant traditions as well and, um, and other, uh, other traditions. There's different theological traditions that are, um, that are very diverse um, um, in, in the ways they approach lots of different topics. There's traditions of service um, uh, that are, that are um, distinct across uh, the, the past 2000 years of Christian tradition and across the world uh, today as well. There's artistic traditions, both in music and in the visual arts um, that are rich and, in, uh, and diverse. Um, there's also ethnic traditions that are, um, uh, uh, that enrich uh, and give diversity to Christian, the Christian faith, uh, and so much more. Um, and so, I don't know, um, if there's, you know, one thing that studying Christian history can do is to um, profoundly enrich our, our own lives and, um, and give us uh, different ways of being faithful Christians that we may not even have seen before if we were raised in one specific tradition for our whole lives and, and didn't do much outside of that. Um, you know, there's so much um, over the past 2,000 years and so much diversity and so much richness to Christian tradition. Um, if you're someone who gravitates towards uh, meditation and yoga and those sorts of things, well, there's, there's something there for you in Christianity. Are you someone who's uh, more of an intellectual, a bookish person? Well, there's that there as well in Christian tradition um, and so many different things. Um, that can be can enrich our own spiritual lives, but also uh, can, um, I don't know, that, that, that are good and, and wonderful and beautiful. Um, and I hope that we've all been able to see that a little bit uh, over the past eight months, that there's a, um, a tremendous richness and diversity to our faith um, and one that can be profoundly enriching to us as we explore it more and as we um, come to know it better. 
Um, another theme is the importance of Christian unity. Um, I'm not sure why I chose the images that I did there. Um, the Pope and the or Orthodox Patriarch uh, embracing is, is one, but those other ones are um, maybe less, <laughs> less evidence of, of Christian unity. But, um, you know, um, I don't know. This is one thing that especially, I don't partly through this class, but also just on my own, um, have been coming to terms with myself that um, Christian unity is really, really important. Um, uh, it's, I don't know, it's a shame to the gospel when uh, Christians can't live together in um, uh, fraternal, no, in, in fam as a family. Um, you know, uh, partly um, we ought to, it, it ought to promote for us uh, a unified social action that we fight the injustices of this world. Uh, we do so with Christians across the whole spectrum of um, uh, of our faith and not just folks from our own uh, limited tradition, uh, even if that tradition is a broad one. Um, and then the questions that I still don't have an answer for, um, should there be uh, unified liturgical traditions? Um, you know, the, the um, Episcopal church, there's a, there's a liturgy that, that we follow or the Orthodox church, there's a liturgy that every Orthodox church uses um, the same liturgy every Sunday. Um, should that be across the board, across Christian traditions, or should we just have one church with, um, you know, is it is it a, a bad thing that we have, you know, Episcopalians and Southern Baptists and Methodists and whoever? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure I, I have an answer to that. Or um, should there be a united confession of faith? Should it be the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed being the lowest common denominator a kind of confession that we all affirm? Um, or, you know, I mean, I was raised in very conservative Presbyterian traditions where um, the Westminster Confession of Faith was the irreducible minimum, uh, basically. And it's a very narrow, very um, uh, limited, I think, uh, presentation of what Christian faith is like. It's a very thin slice of the pie of global Christianity over the past 2,000 years, and um, I don't know. So I, I don't think that we should just be one church. I don't think that we um, should just be one institution. I, I tend to, I don't know, but um, so this is, this is probably the thing over the past uh, eight months that I've struggled with the most is um, uh, all the diversity that we see in, in Christian faith that can be something that's profoundly enriching and good um, is also evidence of a brokenness um, sometimes uh, where there can be hatred and dissension and, um, you know, one group of Christians denying that another group of Christians are really Christians at all um, and what a, what a terrible thing that is. Um, and so the importance of Christian unity is one thing that has stuck out to me over the past um, uh, as we've been going through this. Also, and Maxie talked about this a little bit too, the relationship between church and state and how, um, what a complicated thing that is, um, you know, that uh, the state approaches, operates by power and coercion and wealth, and the church operates by humility, weakness, and sacrifice, and how radically at odds those two ways of approaching, um, you know, existence are. Um, and so how careful we need to be and um, when the church jumps on board with the state or when the state tries to control the church. Um, you know, Maxie talked about this a little bit, but um, in the early Christian pe period, the, the most compelling argument for the truth of Christian faith were two things, martyrdom, but also, um, uh, what's the right term? Um, care for the poor, social justice types of issues were, um, uh, were a, a, a very powerful argument for Christian faith that the, these are people who care for the poor. And, um, you know, it wasn't a theological argument for the existence of God or anything like that, or, or the deity of Christ or anything like that. It was that these people are willing to die for their faith and that they take care of one each other especially when uh, members of their community are, are down and out and poor and sick. And so Christians developed hospitals and schools and, and things like that. There were a power, powerful argument for um, uh, the, the, the goodness and the trueness of, of Christian faith. Um, and then Constantine on the right <laughs> took over and um, uh, power and coercion and wealth became things that um, uh, very quickly and very easily corrupted uh, the church in some ways. And so, um, 
I don't know. Uh, and that's no less true today, uh, whether we are people who supported President Trump or people who support President Biden or whatever side of the pol political spectrum that we're on. Um, there's always the, um, the temptation to, um, uh, for the church and the state to become uh, bedfellows in ways that are, that are not healthy and not, 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 not helpful. Uh, and so that's something that um, I think it's important for us to think through. And we've seen all throughout church history, um, especially when Maxie talked, because that's, that's uh, one thing that he's especially good at is uh, bringing out that type of uh, uh, the relationship between the church and the state. And so anyways, uh, also something that, that I've been working through and that is, um, that's uh, come up as we've gone through these past um, eight weeks is the relative importance of theology, liturgy, and service, and um, how to find a balance between, um, you know, how important is theology, uh, and how important are specific issues in theology, um, how important is the, the liturgy and the sacraments, um, uh, and to what extent should uh, the service of the church be, um, uh, be where we focus uh, who we are. And I tend to think that that is where um, I put that picture in the middle um, because uh, the sacraments and the liturgy ought to empower us for service, um, especially uh, service to the poor, outcasts, and the friendless. Um, and our theology ought to defend and support the poor, motivate us to, to action on behalf of the powerless, um, is where I'm coming more and more to feel um, uh, that, that we ought to land as Christians. And, um, and to the extent that the church did that well in the past um, is a good thing. And when they didn't, uh, when theology became supreme and uh, people were willing to kill each other and burn each other at the stake over theological issues, um, that's not, th that, that's the misuse of theology. That's the, um, the uh, abandonment of the proper use of theology. And when the church and her sacraments and liturgy became uh, the most important thing and the poor uh, were left on the margins, um, uh, again, that's the, the, that's the abuse of the way that things ought to be. Uh, both of those things ought to serve uh, to um, empower us and um, motivate us to um, social action and care for the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized, uh, I think, you know. And then finally, the importance of Jesus in Christian tradition is something else that um, uh, has stuck out to me. You know, other things come and go and rise and fall. Um, uh, but the importance of Jesus in Christian tradition has been uh, one of the non-negotiable things, or one of the things that has most um, uh, impelled the church onward and forward uh, is the centrality of, of Jesus. Um, and, you know, a number of years ago, the, the, uh, the young people, <laughs> I'm old now, so the young people uh, used to wear these bracelets and t-shirts and what would Jesus do? And it maybe comes across as a little bit hokey or something like that. I don't know, but it's actually really not. You know, that has been a central theme uh, throughout Christian, um, uh, our Christian faith, the imitation of Christ, to, to put it more uh, less um, hokey terms or whatever, you know, the imitation of Christ has been uh, a central theme from the early Christian period all the way down to the present with our, our young people. Um, and that's a good thing, you know, uh, uh, not just what, what would Jesus do, but who would Jesus love? Uh, who would Jesus serve? Uh, who would Jesus care for? Um, ought to be the kind of things that, um, that drive us to be who we are and to do what we do. Um, and so for the past 2000 years, the centerpiece of all of this has been um, the person and work of Jesus and um, how important that is uh, uh, to our faith. Um, I think I'm about done there. Um, uh, I do want to say thank you on behalf of me and Maxie and um, Stan uh, for letting us lead you through uh, Christianity the first 3000 years. Um, I know it's been kind of, um, Oh, frustrating or uh, difficult having to do this all via Zoom. And um, especially with you all, you know, you all are a very thoughtful, very bright, uh, very inquisitive and talkative group. And um, and that we weren't able to interact, that it's just been today, even Maxi talking and then me talking and then that's it. Uh, it's a frustrating thing for us because um, 
uh, we didn't learn from you all as as much as we could have. Um, a few questions every now and then, and that's always a nice thing. Uh, but um, it's been profoundly enriching to me and to Maxie, and so I hope that we we hope that it's been enriching to you in some way too. And we all look forward to being able to um, uh, do something in person, face to face, maybe. Who knows uh, when, but um, uh, hopefully this has been an enriching thing for you all. Uh, I know it has been for, for us. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dave. And thank you, Maxie. So, yeah, you so, still there? so much. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. You can hear me? Maxie, can you hear me? I think you're muted, okay. Stan. Uh, oh, I can hear Dave. you, Stan. Sorry, sorry. Okay, Dave was you. You were muted, Dave. Well, I had my volume turned down, so I would interfere with Maxie. <laughs> sorry, that's okay. That was who knows about the Zoom stuff, right? Oh my goodness. I hate it. Well, you you are both princes. Thank you so much, uh, Maxie. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. And like uh, Dave said, I know Maxie and I talked about this earlier. Um, you know, uh, once we're uh, on the other side of uh, our vaccinations and the pandemic numbers are uh, controlled and we've got some herd immunity out there. It'll be great to be in person and do this, uh, something like this. Um, so uh, appreciate y'all so much. Um, any any comments from the class before we uh, close out? We've got a couple of minutes left or final questions for Dave or Maxie. Well, I've got one. Go, Gary. So I'd like to know, um, is there any one particular event in church history that has affected your personal faith journey more than another? Oh. Max, do you want to go first or? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. For me, I don't know. I, I I'd say maybe to, and I'm echoing here. I'm so sorry. I think, I think for me, probably um, apart from uh, New Testament things. So say let, let's bracket out uh, the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Those sorts of things. Maybe beyond that. Um, I'm not sure. That's really a very good question. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, that's a great question. I would need to think about that a little bit. Maybe, I mean, when, when, when I look back over the past 2000 years, um, to me, uh, one of the things that strikes me as especially good is um, I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good question. I, I need to think about that a little bit, Gary. Um, you know, I have to forgive me. I'm an EFM mentor and I, I, I'm trained to ask these kinds of questions. Yeah, I don't David, know. if you don't mind me jumping in. Oh, go ahead, Maxie. Oh, I was just gonna say, I wouldn't pick a particular place, but there is a, there's some, um, every time in the history of the church, when we're at our best, we're loving our enemies and we're taking care of people no one cares about. And that's what my understanding is in the early years of the church, and then particularly moving into the second century, that was what earmarked Christians. They were being persecuted. They were uh, under constant threat. They were misunderstood. Uh, but if you look at the testimony of so many uh, uh, early Christian writers who are trying to explain to their enemies why they live the way they do, uh, part of their defense is, have you actually paid attention to how we live our lives? And the things they point to is, 
We love our enemies. We, we, we will suffer martyrdom before we will become militant against the state or against other, other religious people. Um, and if you paid attention, when the plagues break, break out, we're the ones who stay in town, take care of people. And that, that's, I, I don't think that, that's just a picture of the first century Christians. I know that I see those kinds of things happening in our world today. Uh, particularly, I think the growth of Christianity, as Dave said, in sub-Saharan Africa, but it's at a price. It, it's, it's at a real price. A guy named Emmanuel Contagoli has written a book on a theology of lament. And he says, African Christianity is probably more than anything else rooted in lament and suffering and pain and trusting God in a world that oftentimes seems uh, intent on uh, destroying Christians and not accepting them. And, and the amount of forgiveness it takes for Christians to live in that world and their decision to, to choose to forgive and to seek reconciliation. I, I just think that that's not a modern thing, that's an ancient thing. So for me, I think anywhere that's happening, Uh, I was going to, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, George. A comment about uh, African Christianity. Um, when I have gone to African churches, the thing that is most prominent is the sense of joy. They are a, it is a joyful thing, you know, and um, uh, it, it, there's, a, there's an energy there and a, a spirit there that is... It, uh, it is so remarkable because you would think that it would be the opposite, being, you know, being the, the victims of slavery for so many, many years. But uh, it, it, it's a joyful thing. And, and one other comment from our, our book that we're reading uh, um, from um, uh, our uh, presiding bishop, uh, Bishop Curry says that the uh, church is the only society that exists for someone else. And I thought that is a beautiful way of, of, of kind of summarizing what the institutional church should be like. Thank yeah. you, George. That's very helpful. I, I was going to answer Deacon Gary's question, Dave, and then I'll turn it back over to you. Um, but uh, as I thought about that question, Deacon Gary, I uh, I, I guess my response is, um, you know, that our faith is an incarnational faith um, and that that is the foundation of uh, who we are as followers of Jesus. And so I don't think so much of, of events in church history as much as people. And so the first person that came to my mind was beautifully described by Maxi, and that's uh, of, of the early Christians, a more recent Christian, uh, a guy that we know of as St. Francis, who gave up all the world's goods, um, came from a very wealthy family in order to serve the poor and to spread the message of God's love. I think of Mother Teresa in our, in our own 20th century. I think of Oscar Romero. Um, when I think about your question, Deacon Gary, I think about people. I think about people who embody the life of Christ um, more than events, uh, for me, at least. Dave? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm still struggling with the, with the question. I don't, I'm not sure what I would, um, what I would say. I mean, two things come to mind that I'm um, uh, just in a very kind of selfish way that um, my own spirituality has um, developed over the past couple of years with um, being okay with um, mystery uh, that I see, especially in Orthodox traditions, um, uh, is something that um, I've come to appreciate a lot more over the past um, 
maybe decade or so, um, not having to have everything figured out and how, um, especially the Orthodox traditions are comfortable with that. You know, the traditions that I come from, we're not comfortable with that at all. You know, we want it figured out down to the T, who God is and what God is and those sorts of things. And um, uh, being able to step back and um, be in awe of, of who God is and what God is doing um, is, a, is a, a refreshing thing. And also, um, you know, uh, for uh, someone who comes out of the theological traditions that I do, um, uh, a greater appreciation for the Blessed Virgin Mary is, is oddly enough, um, something that I've really been impressed with over the past um, maybe decade. Um, and seeing Christians from other traditions who um, venerate her um, in ways that I never did growing up has been deeply enriching to me personally. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's a, another kind of thing uh, from church history that has um, uh, deeply impacted me uh, of late, but yeah. Great question, Deacon Gary, thank you. Yeah. And thanks again to uh, Professors Vila and Birch, Maxie and Dave, thank you so much. And for all of our uh, participants, class members, parishioners, visitors, thank you for being part of this. Um, and uh, stay tuned for what we'll be doing next. Thank you all for being here. Bye-bye.